Okay. Now... There we go. All right. There we go. Everyone's got this over here. Let's check out our three scene animations. Here is Cheska's. Tarjiers are small primates found in Thailand, the Philippines, and Malaysia. They are fast jumpers that leap tree to tree. Cool. This is pretty good, Cheska. Tarjiers are small primates found in Thailand, the Philippines, and Malaysia. They are fast jumpers that leap tree to tree. Cool. Okay. This is a really good start. Um, but you did a lot of great things here. This is nice, using the blur to create the shallow depth of field effect with the trees. Um, something that stuck out as just kind of awkward was that this tree looked like just kind of a straight line, just making this look like more of a tree shape sort of stuck out there. And then, yeah, I feel like this design for your Targir character looks good. I don't know if this needs to have a stroke on it. It just ends up making it look a little too, you know, segmented. But you did the absolute right job here of parenting the different parts to make a character. I would try to communicate the shape through some highlighting. And so creating a highlight on some of these parts and back here to define the shape of the Tarjir. And like this, you know, the way that you did on the ear lose the black outlines and do that for the rest of the shape there. You may have to reposition the hand here on this one. That looks like it's there. But this jump animation ended up looking pretty good. Let's look at that again. They are fast jumpers that leap tree to tree. That leap tree to tree. They are fast jumpers that leap tree to tree. They are fast jumpers that leap tree to tree. Cool. This is looking good. Well, you even had it sort of move in. I'm trying to see what you did here. Oh, okay. I see. So you applied the blur over here and over here, and you wanted to make it look like the Targier was coming from the background into the foreground. But you kind of gave that away with this part of the background here. And so in this case, uh, you'd want to blur the whole background and not the foreground, and then have the object move into the blur. So there'd be a couple different ways to do that. Let's see. Because, yeah, the fact that this part of the background isn't blurred looks a little strange. And so in this case, let's, let's fire up some After Effects and do it. Let me close Substance Painter. <coughs> Did everyone else make it over to this part of the stream? Hopefully. Okay, so in this case, you would want to blur the whole background. And so I'm going to make a new composition. We'll call this uh, forest. And the forest is going to be blurred, right? And so if I just grab, I'm just going to make 
it just shorthand this. And just use some noise here as the forest. And so our background is going to be blurred, right? So you did the right thing and you applied a blur there. And so we just put some Gauss blur on this. Um, like you did, right? So blurring the background. But then you have another, you, you have the object that you want to go from blurry to not blurry. And so your um, layer here, let's, we'll do just a circle or something. This will play the part of a Targier. Let's see if I can spell that. Probably not, T-A-R-G-I-E-R, -E something like that. Right, and so it needs to go from blurry to not blurry. There's a couple different ways you could do this. One is just by animate, animating the blur. So for instance, if the position of the Targier is animated from here to here, like so, um, you could simply add the blur to this layer and just animate it. And so it could go from um, blurry to clear here by animating the blur down to zero. And so now you would have the effect of it moving out of the background into the foreground, right? And your foreground tree should be a separate shape that stays clear. So new, I'll just do it with a solid. This is foreground tree. And I'll just mask it really quick. There we go. That's the foreground tree. And so this, we'd want it to be behind that so it looks like it comes in front. But it stays clear because it's in the foreground here. So that allows us to have this go into there, on the tree. And, and like I said, changing some of your Tajir design so that we don't have the black outlines and everything. The animation turned out fairly well. One thing your Tajir needs to do here, I feel, is it needs to blink. Let's look at some res reference here. I mean, it's not like a non-blinking animal, is it? Seems like it would need to blink. Maybe it doesn't blink very much. That one's kind of winking. So the blink here, in your case, could be fairly easy, right? Um, I think you have your eyes as a separate layer. And so, for instance, if I drew an eye on this ball, like this to make a separate layer, right? And so I'll call this eye and uh, make it a child of the Targier, which I think you already have in place. Um, or yeah, it needs to be above that layer, but it needs to be a child of that layer. And so now it'll move with that. So in that case, the blur doesn't transfer to the other layers. Well, we'll solve that problem in a second. Um, 
the eye itself, we can add some blinking just with some scale keyframes. And so now you could very quickly add a blink by just going 100% and then unchecking this and scaling down and then scaling back to 100. But the key is to make it quick. So it's just a very quick blink like that. When it's that quick, I don't think the deformation is that noticeable. And if you want another one, then, well, you wouldn't copy and paste because you did design the eyes symmetrically. But now if I take this eye and also parent it to the head, you know, I get the, the blinking happening. Okay, so now um, the blurring. Uh, yeah, so it's not working because we'd have to copy and paste the blur to every layer. That's not really the most elegant way to do it. And so in this case, I would pre-compose the Targier itself. And then go into the pre-comp and animate the blur as an adjustment layer. And so here, I would add the blur. And it could go from blurry to not blurry. And since it's on the adjustment layer, everything would get adjusted. So adding some blinks. And then your ear motion, you made the ears kind of like how, how we made the wings. The problem is the, weirs, the ears don't always go back and forth like that. And so um, you just need like a more irregular ear motion. They're kind of pointing their ears like a cat does every once in a while. And so if I were to make another uh, layer here, not on the adjustment layer, there we go. There's an ear, and we'll call this uh, ear, and uh, move it behind the head and make it a child of the head, towards your head, there we go. And so now, instead of having the ears constantly going back and forth, I want the ears to occasionally wiggle. And so again, I do something like, uh, first of all, fix the anchor point so that it's more to where the ear would wiggle from, right about there, and just put in some sudden motions. So from here, uh, probably just in rotation, actually, so just R rotation. And so here, and then maybe it rotates a little bit. What happened there? Did I control Z the anchor point? Yeah, okay, so here's my ear anchor point. Let's get that in the right spot. There we go. All right, so now I can keyframe the rotation here and then maybe a little bit that way and have it stay there. <coughs> and then maybe it stays there for a little bit and then keyframe control click here to make another keyframe and have it move down a little bit, kind of like that. Right, so we have these sudden just readjustments of the ear. Uh, you can make spread these out quite a ways. And you know, the not having both ears move at the same time, I think, is key to the way that animal moves. And when you want to make more blinks, it's just a matter of copying and pasting these three keyframes. So you grab an I and you press U and grab these three. And then you can just control C, control V to make another blink. Same thing with the other eye. Control C, control V. And now I get another blink. And both of those things are gonna do a lot for the animal. Targiers are small primates found in Thailand, the Philippines, and Malaysia. They are fast jumpers. So, and same thing here. I think your icon needs to have a blink and then more irregular eye movement and not the black outline around the head. 
but really great start. I think you picked a good topic. This worked. All of this needs to be aligned over on this side here. And if you're gonna, you know, to have this be left aligned over here. And in these projects, let's go ahead and say, don't put the music on the end credits, put it in the video description later when we post it online. And so just put your name here at the end, animation, Cheska Barker. Cool. Let's skip and I'll go to Brecken since he usually ends up going last because of his Owls name. Are special. Although you're probably used to that at this point with the name like Wellnance being alphabetically last in the list. But we'll skip here. Owls are special species that live in many environments and are found in most places except in Tartar. Owls use both strong hearing and sight to hunt for their diet, which mostly consists of insects, small creatures, and the occasional fish. Cool. Owls are special species. Okay, so, um, good. Here, yeah, like we said, let's put this, I know I put it in the directions, I keep meaning to change that every semester. Uh, let's just have your name at the end. Animation, Brecken Wellness. The animation could be a little bit smaller, typeset. Um, this, I think it's good, but it all felt really rushed. Each scene, I think you could have some more space. It's okay to have some space in between the phrases of your, vo of your narration um, in order to make this work. So here, are special species that live in many owls are special species that live in yeah like I feel like the owl icon needs to settle and then transition to the map scene owls are special species because especially because you did read the voiceover quickly I don't think it's too quick but it's quick enough that you there's you can add some space here um, Owls are special species that live in many environments and are found. That live in many environments. There could be space there while uh, to make the beginning scene longer and then the more time of having the owl icons pop up on the globe here so that um, they're maybe continuing to pop up so we don't have such a long time where there's just total stillness. And so they slowly pop up throughout the scene appearing there. Owls use both strong hearing and sight to hunt for their diet. Which okay, and so here's uh, an opportunity for animation, which I don't think was totally, um, yeah, so here, like hearing and sight, having them both go at the same time doesn't let us see and appreciate the animation you put into each one. And so I think, even, like I said, it doesn't need to line up exactly with the voiceover. Like, we can only see this when you're saying the word sound. Like, you're saying the word hearing and sight, and we're digesting the entire sentence, and we can see the animation unfold after that. And so hearing, let's see, what did you do for hearing? You've got some lines coming out like that. That's pretty good. There's another option here with the hearing animation. Uh, let me see, what would this be? If I grabbed a circle and changed it to no fill, actually. We'll just make a shape here, like this. OK, something like that. Now let's get rid of the fill on it. There we go. Uh, I just want to give it rounded ends. There we go. 
Um, and where is the anchor point on the shape? In the middle, good. And so there's another transform here that will help you, the repeater. And so with the repeater, um, this is kind of like the cloner in Cinema 4D. And so when you add the repeater, if you look down here under repeater, there's repeater transform down here. And so this is what's happening to each of the copies. And by default, they're just being moved over. And so if I move this over, you see that the copies move over. If I move it close, they move closer, right? We actually don't want them to move at all. We'll turn that off to zero. But if we go to scale, there we go. We see that we're able to create this wave-like effect. And the number of copies here, you can increase like so. And one nice thing you can do here is animate this, the offset, which allows it to animate in and out in like this propagating wave fashion. And so this, I think, might be a more interesting visualization for the hearing, having this going out in one direction or maybe two directions from, from the owl. Right, so using the repeater so that it offsets through, through uh, all of the repeats there. And this, you could do this with any shape, right? It's just doing this with the uh, just random line I drew there. So I think that might be interesting. And then in terms of the other one, the site, I saw that you zoomed in and then just moved a zoomed version of the background. Uh, one other idea would be to, you know, if this is the background here, let me get rid of the Gaussian blur. And if I make another copy of the background and scale it up, there we go. Then I could create a, what would I move independently? If I draw a mask, This allows me to, I'm moving that. That's not what I want. Yeah, I don't want a mask. I want a track mat. And so here's the scaled up forest, right? We'll call this scaled forest. And um, I'm going to create a circle layer. There we go put this above the scaled forest and call this track mat and then set the mode to alpha mat. Sorry, set the track mat to alpha mat. There we go. And so now if I move this Why isn't that working? That should be working. Oh, it's not working because this is just, it's not an image, it's just a comp. I just need to pre-compose this, that's why. But yeah, so you won't have this problem because you'll have uh, an image that you drew for your background. There we go. So now,
Here we go. Forest. I'm going to duplicate it and call this scaled forest. There we go. And scaled up, kind of like so. Now, above this, I draw a circle. This will be the thing that becomes my magnifying glass. And so this gets set to There we go. Scale forest track map gets set to alpha. Now, if I move this, just come in here and move this, you see it's magnifying the forest. Now, I scaled it up in all directions. You may have to cheat this a little bit so that it's kind of magnifying it in the direction that works for your thing moving. But this allows it to be a live zoom on whatever it is when you're moving this around there. OK? So the magnifier and then scale force set that track mat to alpha. And that'll turn off the magnifier layer. But it's still something that you can animate. right? You can still hit P and animate this from here to there to move the magnification of it. So slowing these down so that we can spend more time doing both of those animations. And then this, this is a pretty good example of what I talked about with showing things in order. Um, but it happens way too quickly. Let that sit for a second or two before you get to the credits, OK? So you could have that animate in. I mean, after this, in a, after this, I might you know, have that wipe off and just have these three animate in on their own blank background. So we have this, and then that, and then these three, versus putting these on top next to the owl. I think that might look better, because they are kind of it just makes for a bizarre composition of the frame there. Also, your size scaling is not quite equal between each one. So Brecken, you hearing this? Does this make sense? Everything I laid out there, right? If it, I think it, having it be longer is going to help this quite a bit. Give yourself some room to do the animation in between each scene. Cool. All right. And Autumn, grab your notebook so you can write down your changes. Here's Autumn's cat video. Cats' paw pads have plenty of nervous systems that give them important information about their surroundings, helping them sense vibrations, textures, and pressure, which allows them to hunt better by sensing their prey. Okay. I kind of went for more of a cartoony sound. Yeah. Hopefully that's all right. What, the, the soundtrack? The, 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 the fonts, the fonts, the fonts. Oh, crap. You can't use that font. Download the, the set of fonts that we use and make sure we stick to it, okay? Um, no, this is a great start. Great start. A few things here. First of all, the resolution and the frame rate. Let's. Check that. You got the frame rate right. Let's see. Why? No. OK. Just because I had it open in that window, it looked strange. 
No, you, you got, or no, no, no. Okay, so yeah, you rendered it correctly, but you, you oh, okay. So you probably selected the right setting in media encoder, but your After Effects comp may not have been the right size. You shouldn't have black bars on the sides, really, ever. So pull it, pull it up once. Is your After Effects comp 1920 by 1080? Yeah, so that, 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 that explains the black bars on this, the sides. So that's, that's the issue, because the, the total size is right, but media encoder um, compensated by adding the black bars on the side. So that's, that's where that's coming from. Let's watch this again. Cats' pop pads have plenty of nerve receptors that give them important information about their surroundings, helping them sense vibrations, textures, and pressure, which allows them to hunt better by sensing their prey. Okay. The... Yeah, uh, yeah, so the... When you do a transition like this, the way you want to do that is that, um, you know, let's say I have, turn this off for a second. And then This. Okay, so this is the cat paw. And so the cat paw is on screen doing its thing, and then we want to have the forest do that circle wipe in. Right? And so anytime I do a circle wipe, I mean, you, you kind of got a cartoony vibe, so I'll give you a pass on using the circle wipe, but I would have it go from the middle of the screen. Like offsetting the circle wipe seems strange. And so putting the, uh, where's this? It's called generate, where's the, where's my transitions? Iris wipe, yeah. What effect did you use? Is it called circle wipe? What is the? I actually used a mask. You used a mask? Okay, so in I think what we just did is somewhat simpler, right? So if you grab just a shape, it allows you to independently adjust it from the layer as far as making it easier to deal with, right? So if I have this scale, I just have this layer here, right? And so I'll just scale it from zero to, oh my gosh, I'm going to control double click on here to center this. All right. So scale from zero. OK. Right? Because this is kind of the motion. Important the motion you want, right? And again, here's my background. I'll go ahead and select alpha mat. And here's the point I'm coming to. Like the, you want this 
series of layers on top of the cat paw. That way, when it animates in, it covers up the cat paw. You don't have to worry about, you know, like, about getting the cat paw off screen because it's just covered up by the, your other scene, which is in its own pre-comp, right? So this shape layer alpha mat, this layer here, that's my force picture. For you, this will be your uh, cat, you know, uh, hill scene, whatever you called that, right? Um, and so if you just wipe that in, and if it's over top of the paw, then you don't need to worry about getting the paw off screen. It just gets covered up by the other thing, which is the much more natural way to, to do it there. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So with that in mind. Have plenty of nerve receptors that give them important information about their surroundings. Having them sense vibrations, textures, and pressure, which allows them to hunt better by sensing their prey. So yeah, you don't need to do a wipe every time. So this one, especially here, you did something I see students do at the beginning, which is the, the, the dreaded double transition, in that we cut and then we wipe in. Don't do that, right? And so here, I think you do want it to be black background, because I like this a lot, the idea of the cat's eye slowly appearing behind the mouse. That was a very elegant way to visually display this, like predatory um, image here. But you don't have it wipe in. Just cut to the mouse on the black background, and then have the eyes fade in, OK? Yes, because so you don't, those, I see this happen with many other students, like they put a transition and then there's another transition. That, no, you don't, just don't want to do that. You want to only have one transition to get from one to the other. And again, just cutting from one scene to the other is fine, right? You've got one wipe and then one cut. That's, you know, having more transitions is not a sign <coughs> of, you know, uh, you know, not, not that great. So, um, I think, yeah, especially if this one's going to be black, I feel like you could have a background color in this, you know, behind the paw. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to use the yellow image with the hand. Yes, yes, that's what I would say. Put the, put the yellow behind there and then wipe to this scene. So you did a good job with the blinking. You went and did the um, ASCII blink there, where you got the uh, blink, and then you intentionally had them blink, not at the same time? Yeah. One of my uh, grandma's cats kind of blinks like that one. It's like one eye first and then the other. And I'm like, I gotta do it like that one. <laughs> and then this is good. And you also can use the thing I just showed Brecken, right? With the repeater to make this look more like a wave coming out. And same thing here from the mouse. You can make it look like a wave of circles coming out from the mouse. Because if you draw a circle of some kind, and it's not a mask, you just draw a circle. And again, get rid of the fill. And put the repeater on. And under the repeater, you gotta be careful here because there's a transform for the ellipse. That's not the one you wanna adjust. You wanna adjust, adjust the transform for the repeater. And transform and then turn off the displacement in space and turn on the scale. Now, it's gonna do it from the center of the layer, although we might be able to just, if we move the anchor point, there we go, we can just sort of dial that in so it looks like it comes out from one point. And obviously, you'd want the stroke to be not that thick, because it does get thicker when it gets repeated. And so making that thinner allows the repeats. So there you go, kind of like that. Nice job with this scene. Yeah, don't do the double transition. I feel like the, you need to give the mouse tail as much love as you did the as the cat tail, right? Yeah. When I got to the mouse, you can kind of tell it was getting to the 5 a.m. part where it was. 
Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So, so go back and give the mouse tail the uh, love it deserves. <laughs> and uh, a mouse blink, anytime you've got something on screen, we, you know, for, it would blink, right? And it can just be the super simple scale in this case. Or if you want to make it the same as the, the other ones you did. Yeah, and then I, I feel like the, you know, like the mouse could have some nose twitch. It's supposed to have a nose twitch, and its ears twitch on my thing, but. Okay, so the ears did twitch. The other thing I was gonna say about the ear twitch is that the anchor point's in the wrong place. Yeah. It should be down here. Yeah, yeah. that's a, one of the things that I adjusted. Okay. Later on. I was like, oh crap, I just realized the anchor point's off, so I should have twitched yeah. it down. Yeah, because it's got a. Okay, so there, yeah, we want to rotate from the bottom of the ear, not the yeah. top of the ear. Cool, and you're gonna never use this font again for the rest of your yes. life. I put it in bold letters and underlined it a million times with my pen. <laughs> Good. Don't, Don't use that one. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. The the scene here with the this turned out really well. This is kind of like exactly what we were talking about, and it's a good visualization of that um, of that part. Yeah. Okay. I was following the video you showed me, but it, I don't know what was going on, but it didn't let me, so I started with the start anchor point version, and that's how it showed up way better. Okay. And then I just meld those separate veins, or actually I mapped out a MacBook patch and just took care of it for 10 minutes. Okay, great. Good. And so every, and if you like watch it, you can see it as the one of the lines approaches the next line, it starts off like that, so it has like a million anchor points just like that, so it Okay. Great. Yeah, you're you're well on your way here. Super. Nice work. And don't worry, Kenna says, "Whoops, I also did a double transition." So, <laughs> we'll get to call someone else out on that in a minute. <laughs> Here's Emily's. Red pandas are mammals that are primarily found in Nepal, Myanmar, and central China. They spend most of their time on trees in their misty mountain habitats. 95% of their diet consists of bamboo, but they also enjoy eating fruits, insects, and bird eggs. Red pandas are mammals that are... Okay. This is this is a good start, Emily. Nice work in this scene. You made this seem kind of cinematic here, and that we've got the background, and you did layer the clouds. This is a good. I would steal this from Emily. Like she's got some clouds in front of layers of trees, and some clouds behind other layers of trees to create that dimensionality there. Uh, tail animation looks really good, right? You're you've got your. Uh, you got your wave going on. You waved in one direction, you waved in the other direction, and then you displaced in time to create the sine wave. Um, let's look Red at pandas are mammals that are primarily found in Nepal, Myanmar, and central China. They spend most of their time on trees in their misty mountain habitats. 95% of their diet consists of bamboo, but they also enjoy eating fruits, insects, and bird eggs. Okay, so I, I think it's really great. The thing that would take it to the next level is just some more movement on our red panda here. And so I can see you did a few things and I'm, it seems like maybe most of this is coming from the puppet pin tool. I mean, I'm gonna assume that this was a puppet pin tool here. Um, being able to take this back in and create a little bit more head motion with the panda I think is gonna be key. I mean, I think maybe you did separate out the head because we get it in two different positions here. Having the red panda look up and down and also putting in a blink or two, like we said with the scale, is going to be good. I like the look of these leaves. That turned out nicely. Um, this, good job sequencing this, one, two, three. It's just too quick. 
and then as soon as it's there, it's gone. It's literally maybe the frame after the three gets into place that it starts fading out. Give it a few seconds before you roll credits, right? Um, to let us digest that. So give your animation some more room to breathe, just like I was suggesting to Brecken. It's not about making these as short as possible. It's about giving them a good sense of pacing. And in general, students cut these too short because you're looking at the timeline and you're trying to jam everything as close together in the timeline as possible. Give it some more space. You know, do this. Do the, um, if I bring this down into here, like so. Do the tilde key so you can look at it and digest it once in a while without looking at the timeline. So you can understand the timing and when it needs a little bit more time to evolve. So you need more time after those icons happen. And burdens. And then, yeah, get rid of this here to just have your name, put the music in the descriptions. And then, um, yeah, a lot of students just put the music on as is. You need to listen to the music. And our videos are so short that a lot of times the video is shorter than the intro to the music. And so you're not actually hearing the main gist of the music. We're just hearing like the intro. And so the music is just starting as the, mu as the video is ending. And so a lot of times you may need to grab the music file and shift it to the left so that the video starts and the music is already in an established place as a background track versus just sort of doing the intro stuff. And then it also makes for awkward timing because it gets to the end and it just sounds like we're just getting started because then the music's transitioning. So a few things. Now with your Red Panda, if you haven't, um, there'd be a couple ways to go about this. One, I'll try and do this example here. I'm gonna grab both of these and say to freeze frame. You won't have to do this because you already have the red panda asset there. But what I'm saying is that you could break it into two parts. If you already have it in two parts, you don't need to do this. But we want to be able to move the head up and down. And so I'll call that head and I'll call this body. And so the key part to this is creating a transition between the head and the body. And so you would do this with the pen tool, but I'm just trying to create a joint around which this can rotate. And so in this case, for the head, it's something like that. And then putting the anchor point maybe right here. And so now, if I were to rotate this, I'm able to lift the panda head to some extent, right? Th I won't have this gray problem here because you're, you won't have this in the background. I'm just using the video versus actually using the layer. And so you want the other part of the, of the neck joint here to be a circle that overlaps so that it gives you some room to turn the panda head. Right, so there we have more of like a seamless looking joint. And so now I can do something with the panda head. Right, this is not something that you would be able to accomplish with the puppet pin tool. It's not going to work in that same way. But what you did with the puppet pin tool in the nose, that works pretty well. Cool. All right, really good start, Emily. Here's Gia's. The polar bear has become the poster child for global warming. Their habitat has been growing smaller as the ice caps recede. But these remarkable animals are proving themselves to be very resilient. The polar bear has become the... Nice. Nice, Gia.
good visual here. We got the melting world and uh, that happening. This looks good. Same thing with the blinking. Giving these animals some blinks will help a lot. What is the other animation we can do here? Just like I explained with the red panda, creating some joints here for the swimming panda, creating a joint here for this panda, right? Only, it's not like you need to make joints for all the limbs for all of these polar bears. You could improve this scene a lot with just a little bit of animation, right? Just giving this bear some more motion, giving this bear some more motion, uh, maybe just making this bear blink, making this bear blink, right? That would all that would all get you know do a lot to make this scene a little less static. There, um, you've got this water issue where we want to make something look like it's going along on the surface of the water, like partially submerged. This bear, again, a little bit of animation here for the bear head, just like we were talking about with the, with the um, red panda neck. A little bit of raising or lowering this bear's head in a couple blinks would really make this bear come to life. If you have time, maybe a tail wiggle, right? That would all help this quite a bit. A cloud or two here, drifting left and right would help. This scene is good with the, the sweating or crying here. This is great. I would just have these you know, scale up real quickly at the beginning versus they just kind of blip on. And so having those scale up on their way down would be good. This looks great. Some more opportunities for animation. Oh, OK, that hair, you do have that bear head. OK, so this bear head is animating. I missed it the first time. So way more exaggeration on this animation. And it looks like, yeah, making the bear head, giving it that overlap joint is going to help there with that, making that continuous. Some more blinks, some movement there. Let's look at this idea of the, of the water issue. So in Gia's instance here, we'll call this water. And um, I'm going to make some water, just a solid color, some kind of blue. OK, there we go. And the, make an iceberg. OK, there we go. That's an iceberg. Uh, for now, let's just make it white. And so now I want this iceberg sort of drifting on screen. So we'll move this over and keyframe and then start drifting this way. There we go. And, and the way that I would do this is add some wiggle to the iceberg. And so, Jacob, you okay? Yeah. There we go. Iceberg. Okay. Let's stay focused here. We're gonna wiggle. We're gonna wiggle Rama, this iceberg, and now that's giving it some movement. Actually, wiggle Rama is always problematic. I don't want to wiggle the position. Let's just wiggle some of the rotation.
All right, I forget what I'm forgetting about the wiggle. Let's just not worry about that for a second. We've got this moving on. Here's the point I wanted to make. This is iceberg. And uh, I want to make it look like there's a like there's some water in front of the thing. And so I'll do, go ahead and duplicate. Yeah, I'll duplicate this le this layer and call this uh, foreground water. And then if I move this, I can see you can see I can sort of cover up part of it. And so now the iceberg kind of moves behind that. But it'd be great if this was more irregular, like the surface of water. And we can do that with an effect called turbulent displace. And so I'm going to put that on this layer. And if you turn up the amount, man, I'm striking out today. What is wrong with this? Oh, we probably need to pre-compose first. So I have it where I want. Now I'll pre-compose. Move. This is foreground water. Then I'll add turbulent displace. There we go. And so now, if I turn up the amount, you can see that it's changing the surface here. We have the amount and the size. I'm going to turn the size down. And we see we start to get more of a wave there. And as this moves, you see it's moving, but it looks like it's behind the wave. It'd be great if the wave itself was animating. And we can do that by animating the evolution. All right, so let me change the color of this. So it's a little more clear what's happening. All right, so here's the one. This is the foreground water here. And so the amount here, maybe we turn that down a little bit. We turn up the size. And then we animate some of the evolution. And so I set one keyframe here, and then set another keyframe here. And now that's animating. And so now you have this moving while that's moving. Probably slow this down by just spreading it out. All right, so now I can move the iceberg. And now it looks like there is water in front of where it is. Again, if I don't have the levels, it all kind of mixes together there. So it looks like we're somewhat beneath the surface of the water. And again, these are all linear. Let's ease all of these keyframes. Cool. And that's going to help out there, making that look a little bit better. But good structure. This is going pretty well. Great start, Gia. Here's Kenna's. A supergiant has two futures depending on its solar mass. One is that if the star has a solar mass between 1.1 to 2.6, it will become a neutron star. Two is that if the solar mass is more than 3, it becomes a black hole instead. Cool. I don't think I caught the double transition. Let's see again. A supergiant has two futures depending on its solar mass. 
One is that if the star has a solar mass between 1.1 to 2.6, it will become a neutron star. Two is that if the solar mass is more than 3, it becomes a black hole instead. Okay, is this a transition or is this the neutron star exploding? Like, is, is that what you want it to be? Like, once it becomes a neutron star, it then explodes? So is this an explosion, Kenna, here? Oh, the blue giant exploding into a black hole. No, it's just a, a star transition. A supergiant has two huge. OK, so let's, I'll look at some of that here. The neutron doesn't explode to a black hole. OK, this camera move here, you need to ease this some more. It does look like it's not linear, but like more easing, whether you move the camera or move the composition, whatever is moving everything to the left here, ease that some more. has two futures depending on its solar mass. One is that if the star has a solar mass between 1.1 to 2.6, it will become a neutron star. Two is that if the solar mass is... Okay, so after this, where we see this happening, you, you fade out, but let it totally go to black and then fade in the the next star because it all kind of runs together there so th this again you don't it's not a powerpoint presentation i think you can just say pulsar or black hole right uh because you're you're providing this information on the voiceover and so that would clean up this um, presentation here, pulsar, and that would give you a chance to animate this. You could say pulsar and have that drop down, um, and then or and then black hole, have that animate, you know, up from the bottom. Because I don't think we need all the numbers on screen. You're providing that in the voice over there. Then I think this one is that if the star this has part a here turned out nice. I like what this ended up doing. It will become a neutron star. Two. Then, but that's what I'm saying. Like, let that, that's the end. So let that fade to black. And it, maybe put some more space in there. Then, your voiceover. Two. Or, you could just start that with or. And then we see Three. the exploding. It becomes a black. Right, because it, it thought to me like the neutrons, it looked to me like the neutron star exploded because... I didn't realize it's the next scene because this one does this and then it looks like it explodes again. And so let that all go to black then. I mean, it would be okay if you just had the star fade to black and you kept the star background, that would be the best. But I'm not sure if your star, yeah, your star has to be separate from your star background. And so let the star totally fade out and keep the star background. And then when you say two, it should have come in with the second part here. Fade the star back in. So we're seeing the black hole and then the black hole there. And so yeah, let me see, let me look at the Kazurkistat. 
um, black hole animation. And so, is this the one we're talking about, Kenna? This is the one? Okay, so they're doing a few different things here. All right, let's talk about this one. So, Okay, there's a few things here. I mean, basically we've got these layers and then we've got these lines. And yeah, like there's no, yeah, but the, I mean, their stuff is definitely 2D, it, you know, m most of it. And so in this case, thinking about these as shapes rather than the, you know, the diskness of it, like getting this shape. So let's break that down. So there's like this central shape, and then there's the shape that goes over top of it, which is in there's kind of this over and around. So I'm going to draw that just with the pen tool. So something like this. Let's clean up the shape a little bit. Ugh, I drew it on the same layer. I don't want to draw it on the same layer. Just click off this layer. This will be the center. Click off of it. And let's draw this again. And then I'll come in here to the path and I'll just forget what the shortcut is for this. Yeah, so come over here and grab the convert vertex tool 
to then turn these into bezier handles. There we go. And then back to the regular tool. V. So we're tuning the shape a little bit. So now, with this shape, I'm going to turn this into a 3D layer, which allows me to hit V, and then I can angle it. But this also needs to be a 3D layer. So both of them are 3D. So this allows me to angle this a bit. And so this is obviously going to be more of my energy layer. And that's going to give me a straight line doing it that way. Yeah, never mind. We won't do 3D layers. They'll just both be 2D layers. And so here, the part of the black hole that's in front of the, um, in front, we're going to need to duplicate. This is the center. I'll duplicate it and put it up here. And so this will be the foreground center. And then this one, I'll mask this off and try to make sure that this tool is selected and that I'm in mask mode and have this layer selected. And now I'll mask off. the top of the black hole. So there we go. Now we have the foreground layer and the foreground, which is the masked off, you know, top part. Then this is the, you know, energy ring or whatever the name is for this, event horizon. And then this is the bottom part of the center. And I'll label this bottom. Now, Part of what's going on here is that there's several layers of energy, right? So you could copy and paste and then um, scale a little bit and change the color. to start to form these layers that are going on like that. So you just keep doing that to form those layers that are going on there. And that sort of, you know, probably maybe adjusting some of the points on the outer layers. 
to start to get to, to that kind of thing on the black hole like that. And then there's the energy going around the black hole. And so I'm going to take the original layer here on energy and copy and paste it. And I'll call this energy ring or energy uh, move. And so here, we're going to use our good old friend trim path. And so I'm going to scale this one down a little bit. First of all, I'm going to just get rid of the fill and then turn up the stroke. There we go. And probably scale it down slightly, kind of like that. And then our good old friend Trim Path is going to do this for us. So go to Contents, Add um, Trim Path. Where is it? Why do I not see it? Here it is, Trim Path. And so in Trim Path, I'll shorten this up. So it's like some energy going around. I'll grab the stroke and give it the rounded cap to look like that. And even as it travels, what are we going to animate here? We're going to animate on the trim path the offset. So this travels around the energy here. And even if this path here was intersecting. There we go. We'll see that the energy will travel behind. The foreground. Black hole level. And so this is what I would animate here the offset. So from here. to there. And in this video, they made the offsets, you know, slightly darker color from the, and so we'll just turn the brightness down, or slightly lighter color, we'll turn the brightness up. You get the idea. And so now this there we go. Uh, maybe we could break this up a little bit in the dashes. And again, the only thing they get animated here is the trim path offset. If you want these energy paths to be a little bit longer. And then once you have one energy move done, you can do the same thing. Just copy and paste it and maybe scale it up a little bit more to create a second one. You might need to move some of the points on each individual path to make it work. But you know these should be below this one. Right, and so now we have multiple paths. We wouldn't want them being in the same place. So you'd have to change your energy move um, trim paths there. Hit U to see their keyframes. And so, you know, just changing this value, changing this value. And so that's going to do it there. So yeah, just going through, you'll need to do a little bit of work getting these paths 
lined up there. I'm trying to think if there's a simpler way to generate that. But is this making sense, Kenna, how this is laid out? The key to this here is that, you know, I masked out part of the foreground of the top of the black hole. Okay, good. That's a good one. That's how I learn a lot of stuff, just sort of looking at things and trying to reverse engineer the lower black hole. Oh, down there. Yeah, just another layer of stuff. So you could just... Uh, You could make another shape. Like that. And then as long as this was at the, ugh, I drew it on the layer again. There we go. Click off of that so we get a separate new layer. Now I'll draw another lower halo here, like this. I'll change it to an energy color. and put it all the way at the bottom. And there we go, so now it's below the bottom of the planet, but underneath the energy rings. And that gives us the same kind of thing. So you have an understanding of how it works like in three dimensions, but you know, just thinking about how to flatten it out and build the image two-dimensionally using layers. Cool. That's a fun one. Yeah, those those uh, videos are great. Uh, simple graphic language, but but very effective. Very effective graphics, graphical language. Cool. There's Kenna's, and here is Stevens. Pterosaurs. Why is everything quiet all of a sudden? Oh, because I did I turn something down over here? The pterosaurs, a species of prehistoric flying reptile that lived alongside the dinosaurs. One of the most peculiar was the mighty Quetzalcoatl, a massive animal. Quetzalcoatl had a wingspan similar to that of a single engine airplane. Nice easing, Stephen. Nice work. This makes Quetzalcoatl one of the largest predators to have ever lived. There it is, devouring a baby Triceratops. Very nice, Steven. Okay, the bounce on animated, but uh, you know, I don't know. Like this, I really like this. It's classy and understated. I don't know, the bounce seems a little bit much. Um, great job here, okay? So this is looking 
Good. Um, this the thing about the the use of the blur here. The, I, it, it just distracted me because I thought the mountains were too blurred. And this sort of wide shot like this, if this were a real camera, it would be a lot of it would be in focus. Um, and so just chill this out a little bit. And then you did a good job building the scene. Just take a mask to give this a little bit of a pattern here so it's not this straight line that goes across because you know you did a good job building this and this, right? So really that's just a matter of you know just making a new solid. Jump around. Jump up, jump up. There we go. We got it. Right? And so now uh, to create a horizon line with some sort of information here, I can grab this and just you know use the mask tool to create some sort of slightly varying ground level there. That'll help a little bit. This makes Quetzalcoatlus one of the largest predators to have ever lived. Cool. Wise animation here, right? We're not seeing a lot of the feet movement of the Quetzalcoatl here, because um, it would be uh, a formidable task, but it's fine. It's, it's great. Um, we get the background one happening there. Uh, some of the, go back and do a keyframe audit of this downward head motion here. I feel like there might not be a joint here. Let's see. No, there is, there is. Yeah, so I feel like this joint needs more motion. Like it doesn't, we see it move there. And then, yeah, I feel like the, the head would be pointed down more here to pick something up that would be over here. It seems like a strange, just very sort of awkward movement there. Like the, the other animation looks great, and this one just sort of sticks out as being a little awkward. So just making sure that you've got your easing in there and changing, adjusting some of that just ever so slightly so that that's a little bit more smooth. This is a really great uh, graphic representation of what's going on there with the plane and the, using the Quetzalcoatl wipe. So look, we can see what Steven did here. So he did it by uh, putting a um, solid below this that pulls onto screen. I might also put the motion blur on the figure that's wiping, because I can tell the motion blur is here, but not there. Because it's not like it's not like we're not going to see it. We're going to you know see it clearly in the next frame. That's great. A little bit of slow cloud movement would be a nice addition. Yeah. These flying bird, the dinosaurs flying in silhouette looks really good. And you got the beaks opening and closing. Yeah, just a few things. Really excellent. And moving the layers at different speeds to create our parallax there. Just not quite as much blur on this. Cool. And if you haven't already, you should check out the, um, what is it called? Prehistoric Planet. I have a feeling you did, and that's why this is a topic. Um, but the episode on this dinosaur is pretty great. Have you seen that yet? Yeah. Yeah, the animation is ridiculous. Yeah, it looks. It looks really the best dinosaurs have, have ever looked, for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they were going for a different thing. They're trying to make them look like real animals, not like monsters that are chasing us around all the time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. 
yeah, it's really quite, quite astounding. They haven't published a whole lot of behind the scenes on that yet. I'm anxious for them to do that. Um, and then, yeah, again, wise animation choices. We don't, he cuts before we swallow the baby triceratops, right? Because that's going to present a whole bunch of issues, right? Uh, how are we going to do that exactly here? And, you know, but this is uh, good. The just it sort of doing that with his beak to get it back towards his mouth. Is, is great. That was plenty because it didn't, you know, it didn't, it felt like it was enough there. That's working really well. Super. All right. Nice work on these guys. All right. We're making, this is everybody who got one turned in, right? Yes. Super. All right. Any other questions from you guys on the live stream? Again, there's not going to be a live stream on Monday. The sports bumper project and the changes on this project will be due a week from today. Well, I'll make them due Tuesday night, right? You know, we usually do Sunday night. They'll be Tuesday night. In fact, I think I already did that. Didn't I do that? Is that showing up on Canvas? Does the sports bumper show up as being due Tuesday night? No, I don't think I did that. I'll change it right now. There we go, now it should be showing up. Okay, great. 